Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Connected Recruiting Workshop with Billy Davis. We are uh, just going to give everybody a few minutes to get logged in here, and then we'll kick off. Right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Connected Recruiting Workshop. This, this workshop is going to cover our engaged stage of Connected Recruiting. Uh, I am Laura Bumby, and I am the Senior Manager of Strategy for our automation suite of products here at Bullhorn. Um, and I'm also joined today by the man of the hour, Mr. Billy Davis. Billy, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everyone. Hi, I, I'm Billy Davis. I'm at staffing automation expert. I've been doing this since about 2015, which is actually before staffing automation existed, kind of as a concept. Um, so I've been doing it seven plus years, done about 300 plus implementations personally, and worked with about 800 plus clients. So happy to uh, distill some of those experiences and best knowledges uh, kind of with you here today. Excellent. Thanks, Billy. Um, so today we are going to cover, um, again, our engagement phase of the connected recruiting cycle. I know many of you were a part of some previous workshops and webinars, and this is really the more robust and the, uh, the strategic follow-on session to those. Um, if you're also new to rec connected recruiting, that's totally fine. Um, all of this will make sense from an automation standpoint as well. Um, so first, we're going to really kind of cover the engagement phase and connected recruiting as a whole, what it means. and and what we're going to cover. Um, then we're going to dive into some best practices, what we've seen companies do really well, what we know work, um, and what we have um, have seen been implemented really well. And then, and then off the back of that, really how to achieve those best practices, what we need to be doing, what we um, practically need to be doing. Um, so before we get started, I'll walk everyone through really the behind the scenes stuff, right? Why all of this is, is truly important. And I think if we look to um, the, what's happening in our industry, right? What's happening in the staffing industry? The most important piece here is that the value system for our talent has changed, right? Um, as we have seen the digitization of the staffing industry and the digital transformation, um, and as we've seen automation come in, um, that's really changed how our, how our industry is viewed and how staffing is viewed both from a technology standpoint, but also what, what talent is looking for. They want speed, they want flexibility, they want choice in the job search. Um, with, that meet, that, with that all happening, talent is also getting younger, right? Things are being made more simple through digital technology. If we think about booking airline tickets, right? What does that even look like before we did that online? Or even booking doctor's appointments or banking, um, shopping for a home, right? Zillow. What did we do before Zillow? How do we know how people were on the market and how much our house is worth? So all of this is changing, and, this, and the talent that is using those in their everyday life is now having those expectations for when they're in the job search as well. Um, so that then turns into really having a talent community. Talent pools we've been talking about for, what, 10, 15, 20 years in staffing, but really now focusing on a talent community, a group of, of people within your brand, within your um, company that you are returning to, that you are engaging and communicating with and, and providing thought leadership to, and then in turn placing them into relevant opportunities. Um, and so this is really the consumerization of employment um, and the consumerization of our industry, right? And with all of that, really experience is the differentiator. Why are you, um, why do you turn to PayPal instead of Venmo, right? It's an experience that you have, that you prefer, and that's really how staffing businesses are going to differentiate as we look ahead. Um, so moving into who, who is this talent, right? We have to account for the changes in these workforce dynamics. Never before in our history have we seen so many different generations in the workforce. And so we not only need to account for baby boomers and Gen X, but we also need to account for Gen Y and Gen Z. And all of these different generations have different perspectives, have different preferences, have different motivations, and so we need to make sure we're accounting for all of these groups um, as we're building out our, at our um, 
talent and automation strategies. And how do we know this is important? Well, every year Bullhorn conducts what we call our grid talent survey. And we understand exactly what talent is looking for based on these results. And we know that we that candidates want to work to, with recruiters. Um, we can go to the next slide there. And we know that most of most of our talent, most of those workers have a favorable opinion of recruiters. They want human interaction during the job search, whether that be an email, a phone call, a text message, some type of contact. Um, but the fact is they also want a better experience, right? I think that's something that's really emerged in the last year or two is that experience has become paramount. And so we also know that whilst recruiters have a favorable opinion, or excuse me, workers have a favorable opinion of recruiters, workers have also given up on the job search because something took too long. They've really highlighted poor communication as a reason that they might not have had a great experience with a staffing company. And they also know that online platforms, online technology has made working and finding a job opportunity easier. So that's what we're really thinking about. And that's where connected recruiting and, and automation all come together to, to kind of handle all of this feedback we're getting. So if we look at the pillars of automation, that's all right. No. Um, and you guys might be familiar with these, right? If you've heard Billy or myself or anybody, uh, any of our other automation colleagues here at Bullhorn talk about this over the last few years, these really are the tried and true pillars of automation. Um, we have our productivity pillar, which really ensures that the right action is happening at the right time. We have our experience pil pillar, which means that candidates and clients are communicated with at the right time. They're communicated with when you want, um, and we reduce those black holes. And then the one that's always happening right in the background is data health. We want to make sure that we have the correct data always. We want to make sure that the productivity and the experience that's happening within your system is happening with the right data. Um, and so this, all of these pillars and all of this information is really where connected recruiting comes in. And connected recruiting is a methodology, right? This is a strategy that we have seen um, clients utilize that is going to empower you to engage your talent at every single stage of that candidate life cycle. Um, so this is taking your top teams, this is taking your technology and your best practices and, um, and implementing a strategy and a methodology to ensure you have the best experience. So if we take a look at an example of what your talent recruiting or your talent engagement lifestyle might look like, right? <clears throat> By being able to leverage these best practices and this technology, you're able to ensure that your um, candidates are going to have an experience as they are uh, incredible experience as they move through these workflows from the moment they come in as a new applicant and they've applied to a job all the way through engaging those applicants and gaining further data and, and screening them through the hiring process and putting them on assignment. And then while they're an active consultant, being able for them to, to again, return to your community and to your um, to your community and, and do the things that they want to do, and then ending their assignment, getting a recommendation, getting a referral, and getting feedback that you're able to then utilize moving forward. So this is really um, kind of what that looks like and how our connected recruiting strategy overlays onto that life cycle. And what all this means is that you're going to really re require an omni-channel communication strategy. Um, this isn't multi-channel, right? I always like to say that. This isn't getting a text and an email at the same time. This is making sure we're using the right type of communication at the right time. Um, and neglected to say at the beginning, sorry, everybody, but I'll say it now. We're going to have some polls during this session, so we would really love your input here um, to understand kind of where you guys are at because it's really interesting to see. But um, thinking about kind of how you're engaging with candidates. Um, what channels of communication you're using. And we, um, and that's something that we're able to do through the connected recruiting strategies, have that omni-channel engagement. Um, so what's in it for you, right? If we think specifically now about the engage phase, what's going to happen when we get to this? We talked um, previously in the connected recruiting strategy about kind of that attraction phase and that's bringing candidates in. So now when we're into the engage phase, what does that really look like? Well, that looks like an increase in response rates, right? To emails and texts. That looks like an increase in having complete data. We've brought those candidates in. 
we're going to ask them questions and, and complete that profile or fill the black holes for the data we don't have. And what all of that means is that you're going to increase the engagement within your database. You're going to improve stale candidates. You're going to improve candidates that get lost in the shuffle. Um, all that will be happening as we're implementing this engaged part of the connected recruiting strategy. So I have some examples here of what that looks like. Um, and these are all examples from, from clients who have implemented the connected recruiting strategy. And this is with automation, right? So we're seeing results like this. 78% open rate, click rates at 15% and upwards of upwards of that, knowing that you know, industry standard for email marketing is what between one and five percent. So we're really seeing great results. Um, it's also communication performance. Um, if we move to the next slide, again, similar communication performance, just great percentage of open rates and click rates for emails that have been sent. If we then move on to text messaging, again. Text messaging already has a better response industry-wide from email. We know that. Um, but this is exponentially higher from a, from a response rate percentage. So being able to know that as you're sending text messages, you know, 70, over 75% of those text messages are being responded to, which is excellent. And then last but not least, looking at NPS scores, right? Making sure that we're building a community of promoters who are going to be able to recommend our business, um, provide referrals and also be, be candidates that want to go back out on assignment, right? They're going to return to our talent community over and over again. And we'll see the investment that we've put in. <clears throat> so here's a little before and after for you. Um, again, the connected recruiting strategy is something that we work really closely with clients with. But um, this particular client had, had this type of example, right? Over only half a percent of their database was fully engaged within the last six months when they implemented, implemented um, the connected recruiting strategy based around automation, over 40% of that database was then engaged. So thinking about all the things, I always like to say, and I got this from Billy, but um, <clears throat> that automation is really like compounding interest, right? If you do the right things, if you're keeping a healthy database, that's gonna pay you in dividends. And I think this is a great example of that. And last but not least, some great feedback here, right? So after we cleaned up our data, our recruiters regained confidence in our database. How important is that, right? How many of your recruiters right now are going out to LinkedIn or Indeed or Monster, Career Builder, the first place they're going, and they're finding a candidate that's already in your database? So the capability and the ability to be able to have that database engagement so that now the first place your recruiters want to turn is your own database and being able to source from within there. Not only does that increase speed to submission, but again, it allows you to capitalize on the investment that you've been making to acquire those candidates over many, many years. So with that, Billy, I don't know if you have anything else to add, but otherwise I'll pass it to you. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, that was great, a great overview. And obviously I'd love seeing those kind of success stories and kind of a, a high mark to shoot for on what happens when you optimize your automation and engagement strategy. So with that in mind, Kind of want to walk through and put together here some uh, the engage phase best practices and some examples of how you can achieve that yourself as you're starting to try to you know increase these rates and and, and to overall make make the experience and process better. So the first and also I just want to mention if there's any questions that come up as we're going along, please feel free to to post them in the Q and A portion. We did leave some time at the end. Uh, to kind of go over those, and if we don't get to everything, uh, we don't have, we don't have time today to get to everything. We'll be sure to uh, answer those offline and, and also provide those answers. So if there's any questions, feel free to fire away. So the first best practice here is around really where to start, and I've seen this one kind of over and over again, where you want to start with transactional communications so that you ensure that your email deliverability in particular is really high. So oftentimes people get really excited about doing, you know, big, large re-engagement campaigns or trying to reactivate candidates they haven't talked to in a long, long time. And while that is a really high ROI use case and is really great, if you email 200 or 300,000 people that you haven't talked to in a few years, you could nosedive your deliverability and end up in spam. Um, so really what you want to do is supplement and kind of 
chip away at those types of use cases while you're also doing really high engagement, high percentage communications around things or people that are in process. So how do you achieve this? What does that look like? Automations like placement touch points. So it's your place talent. You're kind of checking in on them. So you're gonna have much higher engagement rate, rates there. People that are in the kind of submission or sales cycle where they're interviewing, providing updates on their submission status, kind of where they're at in the process, um, letting them know, you know, if, if it didn't work out, just again, providing that update, being really communicative. Obviously, from the candidate experience side of things, that's going to help a lot because that's a, that's an area where staffing and recruiting typically and historically has struggled. Things like screening follow-ups, right? So someone is going to be very motivated uh, to communicate and stay engaged. And then, you know, utilizing the tools at your advantage, like, you know, NPS scoring um, at, at each of the key life, sta life cycle stages, um, but if you start with those transactional communications, you ensure deliverability is there, then you can start chipping away at some of your, your larger reactivation and re-engagement campaigns. The next tip is all around, and, and obviously like we could probably have a whole uh, different webinar about this because this, this gets really exciting and, and um, there's lots of different things to unravel around in, improving data quality. But if you improve the data quality, you'll be your marketer's best friend because quality data allows for quality segmentation. And that's the best way to provide the right message to the right person at the right time. So, you know, that starts with a healthy data set, a healthy database. And obviously the more you can know about the candidates and clients that you're engaging with, the, the more you can cater those messages to where they're at in the particular recruitment and staffing life cycle. And then the higher your engagement rates will be because you're able to be more prescriptive uh, with your segmentation. So kind of a few things that you, you can do as you're trying to achieve this. Um, I've seen, you know, the option to, to upload a resume and have that automatically parse into your system be a really powerful tool here because it's something that you kind of kill multiple birds with one stone. So you, you get a resume, a updated resume from a candidate that can automatically go and parse into the database automatically that's going to update a, a whole bunch of fields with things that you don't have to do line by line now. But then also it's a great indicator of how interested that candidate is that they have an updated resume and that they're sending it to you. So it, a variety of, of really good things happen. Uh, and of course, from a, from a data kind of hygiene, data health perspective, really good things. Um, utilizing the survey and chat writebacks and that functionality is a really great way to increase your data health. This allows candidates and clients to update their own data, right? So it, it kind of removes and, and helps amplify your own internal teams um, if there are any gaps in your data where you can um, you know, kind of make that happen. That leads to the third point here, which is some of my favorite automations where you reduce the data entry either from internal staff or from the candidate or client because you can use known data to fill in data gaps of places that you don't know. I'll give you a couple of my favorite examples of that. You know, Say you have a candidate that applies to a job, but that candidate doesn't have um, desired pay rates on their candidate record. That candidate doesn't have a position job title on their candidate record. That candidate doesn't have information like categories or skills or industries, whatever you use in your staffing um, firm. You can use that data from the job that they applied to and copy it and move it into those fields on the candidate record. And while it may not be perfect, it is going to be so much better than having blank information there. So you can use, make inferences about information that, that you know to fill in data gaps in your system. And that'll make everybody happy because that's happening. Machines are doing it, it's happening automatically, and you don't need any input from either the internal or the, the candidate client side of things. You wanna make sure to kind of, to get a healthy data set, data quality, you wanna identify and fix any root problems. So the first place to start there is do an audit of everything that's coming into your database. So look at what are all the possible ways that someone or something can enter into the database and then figure out how can you improve that? How can you simplify it? How can you make sure that the data that's coming in is of higher quality? And if you do that 
automatically your problem is not going to get worse. It'll get better over time. So if you kind of fix those root causes, it can be a really great way to kind of draw a line in the sand, improve things from there. And then you can start chipping away at some of the historical and kind of clean up exercises to really kind of get, get the most benefit. And then lastly, something I've seen be wildly successful, both from a data health perspective, but then it can also unlock some really interesting business intelligence uh, type value is you can use automation to enforce status definitions. So candidate status, job status, client status, status in your ATS CRM usually is the lead indicator as to where someone is on the journey. And you can create definitions and then have automation and enforce those definitions. So for example, in my staffing days, an active candidate in our world was a candidate that had a screening done in the last 12 months. And they had either a submission in the last six months, or they had a two-way engagement or communication in the last six months. So what that meant was we, we put those that definition in place we created automations and process around it to enforce it. But what that meant was if we saw someone in the system with an active status, immediately our recruiters knew exactly what that meant. And then we also were able to pull that number and kind of create business intelligence and figure out how many how many candidates, how, how many clients we had in each status bucket, and we knew what it meant. So it became a really powerful tool for strategy and to kind of increase what we were trying to do. The next tip is, is around enabling self-service. And this kind of throws back to some of the earlier points that and, and examples that Laura brought up around kind of where we're seeing in other areas of our life, right? Where we can self-serve most of the time with online banking apps, you know, so many things in our day-to-day -day kind of world, we can take care of ourselves through self-service. So enabling that for candidates and clients is gonna really pay dividends. So how you do that, surveys and chat right backs, definitely kind of example number one there, Re really helpful uh, as far as making that happen. You give the ability for candidates and clients to control and update their own data. Um, integrated website forms, I've seen work really well, especially for kind of lead generation or business development sales types of things. I mean, the key aspect here is you want those website forms to uh, kind of integrate fully with your database CRM so that you know, you're not kind of having to, to um, kind of smush, smush or, or kind of compile things together. And, and you want to make sure that it, it writes back to kind of your single source of truth. Um, automated and efficient onboarding is definitely something that we've seen be a really big focus um, around self-service, you know, ensuring people have the right documents, getting notified notifications and reminders to kind of keep that process humming along and then providing avenues where someone can, can update and manage uh, those documents and, and make sure that it's progressing. It's a really important um, kind of process. And then another way that you can get out ahead of this is to deliver the right information pro proactively. So things like FAQs, you know, commonly asked questions, um, which I'm sure you all could come up with that you get over and over again throughout either the submission or placement lifecycle. You know, if you provide those answers and that information up front, you, know, you can kind of headway and, and allow a candidate to answer their own question before they have it, which uh, is a huge form of uh, efficiency boost. And then a little tease here at the end, I, I can't reveal any information with details, but we have several things uh, working behind the scenes that will enable some more self-service uh, functionality that are really exciting for the industry. So I'll, I'll leave that little tease there, but uh, really excited about what that's going to unlock uh, here in in the near near to short term future. So this next tip is is around enabling communication method and frequency preferences. So this is a big one, because especially if you're dealing across multi generations, they have very different preferences typically about the their preferred kind of method of of communication. So really important for an omni-channel um, kind of approach, not only having the different options, but then figuring out which option to use when, right? And so the best way to do that is to, you know, ask your candidates and clients, you know, what's, what's the method, how they prefer. And then also the frequency preference is a big aspect of this as well. 
And that's something that changes depending upon where somebody is in, in their life cycle, right? An, an active job seeker likely is going to want more frequent communication than somebody who's passively looking. That's just one example of that. But the biggest reason for somebody opting out of your communication is getting too many communications in a, in a short time period of time. So if, if you can kind of head that off by logging their preferences and then acting accordingly, really can uh, increase your overall engagement rates. So how to achieve this, of course, you know, the, first, the first way to do this is you need to ask. So you can gather that information and you need to store it in, a, in the right place so that you can action kind of on it. You also need kind of in your messaging to acknowledge that sometimes it just won't be possible, right? There's, there's some things that you won't be able to do over SMS or you won't be able to do over chat, uh, regardless if that's a preference or not. Um, so you know, just kind of acknowledge what are the situations, what, what are the times in which it won't be possible to cater to all different communication types. But then there'll be lots of opportunities where you can. And that's where you kind of create your automations accordingly to kind of take uh, in line those preferences from candidates and clients. And then kind of, you know, and then also the frequency side of things to make sure that you're not sending messages too often. And also goes into more, more having kind of a high level holistic approach of what are all the engagement things that you're doing holistically as, as a business and ensuring that you know, things aren't clashing, you know, somebody isn't getting a uh, communication from one place and then also another from another at the same time. So it's just kind of making sure that there's agreement uh, amongst kind of the, the total engagement mission to achieve that. Number five here is, is all around adding value beyond jobs. So obviously from a staffing and recruiting perspective, candidates and clients are coming to you because they want a job or they want you to fill a job. But if you can add value beyond just the job, that's how you can really provide a great experience to a la much larger percentage of your candidates and clients. Because there's going to be some candidates, some clients you're not going to be able to, to place. But if you can still provide them value, you can still leave them with a good experience. So thought about this kind of briefly, but there's a lot of more examples than this, I'm sure, but here's definitely a good place to start. You know, obviously your recruiters, they're, they're the experts in their domain. So, you know, providing and unlocking career advice, really valuable thing. Salary guides are another common way to add value. You know, you see a really large portion of the market. Um, you have some really important insights there and information typically and, and data that people really, really want, really um, kind of crave. Um, industry trends and tips, another one that, that's really great. You know, if you're, you're an expert, you're subject matter expert in your various uh, industries and niches that you uh, recruit for, you know, unlocking and using and leveraging that experience and providing it could be a great way to add value beyond the jobs. Um, candidate and, and client market information. Again, uh, something that... Um, I, if if you have candidate data, your clients are really going to know what it says, what it what is what is trending, what it's showing, and vice versa. If you have client data, your candidates are really want to know what what that is to help them make better decisions, and and, and inform them. Um, then you know, like kind of some classics here around interview trends and tips, resume tips, screening tips, those types of things to help arm the person to to do better, to improve. Um, you know, all of those things. So it could add a tremendous value when you do it right, um, kind of beyond just the job search. This next best practice is kind of, this is where you get the ideal engagement rates, not only engagement rates, but then kind of positive and great experiences as well, is when you mix automated and human connections and communications. So, I mean, you don't want to be 100% uh, automated. You also don't want to be 100% kind of human communication, right? You want to use kind of the best of both worlds, mix and blend those. And when you do that optimally, you achieve really high engagement rates, efficiency rates, but then also provide a great experience. So how to achieve this you can use internal reminders, right? So instead of having a cadence, say a, a placement automation or something like that, setting so up a, a cadence of five, six, seven in a row, uh, automated emails. You could have two emails and then the third could be a reminder to the recruiter to reach out with a phone call, reach out with a LinkedIn message, uh, reach out with, with a text message, or you, you can mix mix those things in. 
But um, or one of my favorite things in the world, which not many people do very often anymore, is is writing a, a handwritten note and, and mailing it. Right. It's it's something that is a huge separator because it doesn't happen often at all. But those are the types of things, those kind of human touch points, human uh, communications. That's how you can create some of those kind of wow experience moments that really will stand out. And then obviously that that's a great way to provide an incredible experience, which has a, a variety of benefits. And then also in that communication that you're sending, you, know, you can provide instruction uh, and kind of what needs to be adhered to, to to follow best practices. So it can be a way to um, you know make sure you kind of line up and, and prepare your internal staff to be successful with that outreach. The next best practice is around delivering an incredible end-to-end -end experience. So obviously easier said than done, and this takes time, but this is to, to achieve you know, kind of optimal and incredible engagement rates. You're going to want to provide an incredible experience from day zero to, to the to throughout the whole process. So kind of where to start on this is the first place you need to go is you need to map and understand what your end to end process is. Right. And, and this can vary for the different personas that you're you're helping it would be candidates, clients. You could actually have different uh, end to end cycles, depending upon some of the subcategories within those. But at a high level, mapping it and understanding it's really important. So you can make sure you're filling in the gaps, you're not leaving anything, um, you're not missing any opportunities to, to provide a really good experience. You need to actually have, have a desire, right, to improve and optimize every step of that process and cycle. Um, and then, of course, you can't improve or optimize what you're not measuring and reporting. So that's that goes hand in hand. And then, right, use feedback, use use the information that you're gathering to continue to improve. Um, and, and this one is, is one of those that you kind of you continually work at, but any improvements that you make um, provide huge, huge benefits. The eighth best practice here is don't don't let people fall into the ATS abyss, right? This is the kind of the, the hallmark of uh, historical staffing and recruiting is you meet and talk with so many people that inevitably someone is forgotten, is not communicated with, is told, hey, I'll, I'll call you back. And then it ends up not happening, right? So you want to put things in place to ensure nobody falls into that ATS abyss. So how to make that happen? Um, automations like, you know, kind of a, a top talent reminder and check-in. You know, so if if candidates or top talent candidates haven't had a note or a communication in a week, two weeks, whatever time frame that you're that you're kind of deciding upon, to have either an outreach or an internal reminder go out to make sure that those candidates stay top of mind. Obviously, top talent is a great place to start with that because you know your competitors would like nothing more than for your best candidates to be forgotten about and go to them. So you wanna make sure that never happens. And then you wanna you kind of build engagement and nurturing campaigns. Right? That's a great way to prevent people from falling into that ATS abyss, you know, to ensure that they're getting kind of nudged and moved along each step of the life cycle and not kind of forgotten about. And then kind of creating those safety nets of communication, creating the process reminders, to, to ensure that everything is kind of moving along as it should. And that if there's outliers or things are stuck or in, in a phase for too long, right, it's getting kind of bubbled up as an escalation uh, so that it's not forgotten about. Number nine here is, is all about asking for feedback and using those answers to improve, right? It's one of the best ways that you can increase your engagement rates. So where to start with this and how to make it happen? You wanna ask more than once. I mean, the, the first first step of it is just to ask in general, but then to increase the actual feedback that you get, um, you want to make sure you, you ask more than once. And then once you're asking someone's responding, right, you kind of you want to react accordingly based on the feedback and, and what they're providing. So a nice framework that I like and I seem to be really successful is that kind of positive or promoters, people that are really, really happy, you know, ask them for referrals, testimonials, also ask them what about your process made them really excited or why did they have a great experience? Oftentimes you can get some really great insight as to what's working, which is, which is an important consideration and kind of what you can lean more into to, to unlock a better experience for all. 
those people that are in the neutral kind of category, they're oftentimes the best to figure out what are the ways that we can improve? Like what are the ways that we could make your experience great instead of all right? You'll find a lot of kind of pain points or little small things typically, but it'd be a really good opportunity to to gather those insights, act on them. And then obviously if you, you put them in place, you can start moving that, trending that in the right direction. And then kind of negative or, or kind of gl glaring detractors, right? Usually that warrants a, a notification or a, a reach out, um, kind of a human intervention, to try to firefight the issue before it spreads, it gets worse, before they blast you on social media, right? leave you a, a bad Google review, those types of things. You want to see if, if you can fix the situation or at least make them feel heard so that they don't feel like they have to tell everyone and everyone everywhere um, how terrible you are. And of course, you know, if, if there's any root causes that you can kind of figure out of what caused that experience and you can fix, I'll see that that's a good thing as well. And then another tip here that I've seen be wildly successful is your feedback rates will jump when if you when you're asking for feedback, if you list examples of previous feedback that you've implemented that led to change. So, I mean, just think about kind of two different approaches, just asking somebody, um, you know, we value your feedback. Uh, would you please take five minutes to answer this, the, this five question survey? Let us know how we did, right? That's kind of approach number one. And then approach number two would be, you know, we, we want your feedback. We, we, we want to continuously improve. In the past six months, here are three things that we've improved and changed based directly on feedback from, can, from candidates or clients, depending on who you're communicating with. And then we want to know kind of yours, right? And then asking them that same five question survey. So the second option there is going to have wildly better kind of feedback engagement rates. Um, of course, a caveat here is you also need to be willing to make the changes if, if it makes sense for, for kind of good ideas. But um, I imagine most of you would be. Then lastly here, number 10. So, and this is kind of a, a truism and, and obviously th this is a variety of benefits that this, this comes into play, but you know, having your ATS and CRM be your single source of truth. All right, so that, that's, a, if you get there, automatically you're gonna unlock higher engagement rates. So how to do that? Um, an old saying of mine that, that worked quite well and we, we use internally that if, if it isn't in the database, it didn't happen, right? So making that your standard. Um, no longer, oh, I called the person, but I forgot to log the note. If it's not in the database, it didn't happen, All right? So kind of getting that adoption, getting that buy-in internally. Um, ensuring that your, in, your entire tech stack is fully integrated, right? So you're not dealing with siloed technologies, siloed databases. We have to try to marry that up somehow. Like if everything comes back into that single source of truth, your ATS CRM, right? That's going to be a lot more beneficial for you and also avoid some kind of blunders or mistakes possible. Like, you know, for example, engaging somebody that's already been engaged with in another silo, right? If everything's writing back to the same place, you can avoid those things. And then lastly, you know, kind of how you get that internal buy-in, how you get internal employees, kind of excited and, and living up to that standard. Uh, you got to measure it, but then also kind of show the benefits of, of what happens when that is the standard and that is followed. So just to recap here, kind of, kind of what we covered, you know, 10 best practices around how to in, increase your engagement rates. You want to start with transactional communications, improve data quality, enable self-service for candidates and clients, Enable communication preferences and communication frequency preferences. Add value beyond just jobs. Mix automated and human communication. Deliver an incredible end-to-end -end experience. Avoid the ATS abyss. Don't let anybody fall there. Ask and then use the feedback provided. And then create that ATS CRM as single source of truth as your standard. So with that... Kind of we'll move here to the the Q and A portion. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to enter away. And I think we have a couple uh, from from the presentation. So let me look here. Oh, cool. Yep. Yeah, so someone was asking about 
um, kind of an example of around the active status. And so it kind of when it comes to defining status, so I'll just I'll say that again, what, what we used to do. So in, in our world, it was a candidate that had a screening in the past 12 months. So a screening was a, a note type um, and a screening in our world just, just meant and kind of we went through a, a series of uh, questions or information to make sure that we had updated information for the person if we were rescreening them or we if we're they're new that we had kind of the essential information that we needed to place recruit them so that was piece number one then piece number two was and they either had a submission in the past six months right so they applied to a job or we or we submitted them to a job in the past six months or there was a two-way communication in the past six months so a two-way communication, meaning that engagement happened. So um, either they had an, there was an inbound communication from the candidate, right? Because then automatically that there's two-way communication happening, or there was an outbound effort from us that was successful. So it was a phone call that we connected with a person. It was a text message that they responded back to. It was an email that they opened, clicked, interacted with. Um, and then all of that was kind of delineated in note note types or other uh, engagement metrics. But that's how we defined it and it became um, really powerful because like I said, that that active candidate search in the database uh, magically became really powerful. And that was kind of the first place you'd look. And if you found somebody that was active and qualified, Sid knew that that person was already ready to go. So it was great. Cool, so another uh, question came in. Um, what is the most important consideration with uh, omni-channel communication? That's a, a great question. And I know a lot of people are kind of wondering where to start or kind of how to optimize that because it's it's somewhat relatively new. Um, I would say kind of the most important consideration would be kind of that single source of truth concept, that kind of full integration back to the ATS CRM, um, especially when you have multiple communication channels right? Kind of if, if it's not coming back to that single source of truth, you have a lot of potential for haywire and kind of problems. So I would definitely recommend um, ensuring that's a fully integrated solution because um, that's going to allow you to avoid a lot of the pitfalls of, of kind of over communication or kind of getting your wires crossed, so to speak, in the omni-channel world. Cool. Another question came in. Uh, any data we have on whether kind of simple emojis used in subject lines, communication, or text messages increase or decrease in engagement? It's a great question. Uh, I don't have any data off the top of my head. I, I know from experience, um, I, I've had a lot of success kind of using using those. Um, one thing in particular I've known that's worked really well is like you, you can do some of your feedback and rating surveys and kind of use um, emojis instead of numbers. So it's something I've seen work really well, especially when you're that first question is inside kind of embedded in a rich text email it can look really nice. Also kind of provide a, an easy, easy way to do it. If any of you um, have gone to engage before, you know, kind of think of you know, anytime that you leave a, a presentation, you have that quick uh, as you're leaving the, uh, the door, that quick little rating and it's all faces right, of how you enjoyed the session. So kind of think like that in general, right? The, the less kind of friction that you can, you can have the, the higher engagement rates you're going to, you're going to achieve. So, so make things as, as easy as possible for people. And then, you know, as far as like subject lines and things like that go, um, you know, standing out and being different seems to, to work really well. Um, of course you have to kind of walk the fine line of, of doing that in the right way, but one thing I would really recommend doing is is utilizing like A/B testing, which is something that we have natively, where you can kind of experiment and, and try to get your own data sets around um, what work, what's working, what's not working, kind of data driven insights around um, kind of performance. And you can do that subject line. You can do that, you know, different um, formats of the email itself, rich text versus plain text, right? You can you can A/B test a, a wide variety of things to to achieve that. Okay, let's see. A couple other questions here. Um, question around kind of showing a, a technical example around kind of how to build an, an automation. 
let's see here to, to email respond to applicants okay yep so is there anything you would recommend that co that combines a technical fit from resume with the job they applied to so that's a great question um and there's a few few ways that i would approach that um that's like someone someone applying to a job um you know that's coming in like it's a, it's a great use case to just have a kind of a, an email that fires out acknowledging that that they've that you've received their application right so they're not left wondering if it's just floating in the ether or not um actually I had one example comes to mind where i one of the clients i worked with didn't have something like that in place and they would frequently have candidates apply like 10 15 20 times to the same job because they weren't sure if the application went through or not which obviously is not great when you're when you're going through the web responses and such so you know putting something like that in place is to assure somebody that you know, you're, you're getting it and kind of you can cut down that is a great thing and then the second part of this question it's actually it's a complicated automation and setup well somewhat complicated automation setup but really really valuable where you can kind of structure your jobs in a way where you build in some knockout questions and then you can kind of follow up and kind of sift and screen applicants uh, depending upon their answers to those knockout questions so think of think of a job think of of kind of three questions that you would ask them kind of yes or no toggles that if someone answers no to it's going to be like a deal breaker so say say it's a job where you need governmental clearance right so it's one of your questions do you have the required government governmental clearance if the answer is no right like the application can't proceed for that job so the the idea being there um you know if you can set that up in a way so that if someone answers no, it kind of knocks them out from that particular application, that job, and then you can you know, kind of move them to a different cadence. But if someone answers yes to everything, that means they're kind of green, green lighted. You can let recruiters know, um, kind of fast track that submission, but it can be a great way to increase your efficiency. So that's a great question. Uh, there's a I have a bunch of content around that. Um, one of our one of the engaged pre presentations we did. Um, kind of walk through a step-by-step -step process of how to set that up. So if you're interested, uh, reach out and I'll see if I can coordinate um, and kind of and get that your way. Okay, another question here is um, asking how much of a difference does does the, a proper integration with your ATS website technology stack have versus having those separate data silos and kind of things being independent? Um, and, and do we have stats or revenue impact assessments? I've seen some data around it. I don't have anything at the ready, but I mean, from from my experience, you know, working and, and seeing it on both sides uh, of of the coin, uh, and especially having a, a website that's kind of like specific for staffing and kind of you know built customized for you, um, you know, having having the the information go to the right spots, the right places, you know, allowing you to nurture communities, uh, you know, having the content being SEO friendly, like some of those types of things. Like the difference of having that and not having that is is night and day revenue and experience wise. So um, definitely encourage anybody who's interested in that, reach out. I know some really, really great um, partners that do some awesome websites. Take a look at some examples uh, that fully integrate and, and do a great job. The next question here is around um, kind of, do we recommend self-service for uh, just for candidates only, or is it recommended for both candidates and, and contacts? So great question again. Questions here are top notch, by the way. I really appreciate you all. Um, I think the, and the answer for this is depends, <laughs> which isn't, um, it, that's the easy answer, but I'll try to kind of flesh out on some of the factors that it might depend upon. Um, I think updating your information, I think that's probably, that's usually a candidate uh, only use case where you're asking, you know, is this your updated email or your updated phone number? Is this the, the, the job types or job roles you want? Is this the pay rates? Like those types of things usually are candidate only. Um, the client side, I think you, you have to be somewhat careful of and how you approach it um, in, in a few different ways. Something I've seen be really successful is enabling self-service around like uh, send outs. So like um, 
So sending out a, a candidate to a client, see if they're interested to interview or, or place the candidate. So enabling self-service or resume review, um, I said that around the send out process, um, like a, approving time, like so trying to, to remove friction there. Obviously there's there's some other considerations you have to to, to be aware of around you know compliance and, and things of that nature. But um, I think there are good opportunities for clients as well. And in general, right, uh, you know, both are people, candidates and clients are both people. And if you can make kind of what you're asking for them friction as frictionless as possible, which self-service is, is typically a way to get there, uh, it, it becomes really powerful into getting higher completion rates, but also boosting the experience uh, for those involved. Okay, so those are those questions. Okay. Cool. Um, and it looks like just a, a follow up. We can, I certainly, I'll, Jessica, I'll, I'll follow up um, with, with some of that additional information. Thanks for that note. Well, another question that came in. Um, so my database is a mess. Where, sh where should I start cleaning it up? Um, so number one, I'll, I'll let you know you're not alone. Um, so, you know, don't, don't feel badly about that. Um, I, I would start again, audit that your intake process, right? So, so make sure that uh, data coming in is, is getting cleaner, getting better. Um, fix your duplicates. Right? M most of the time, duplicates is a, is a big, big headache. So definitely fix that there. Um, also think about an archive strategy around um, like one thing that we do is, is like archive candidates that have no contact information and haven't had any activity of any kind, submission, placements, notes, engagement, et cetera. Um, you know, f remove those, archive those candidates if, if none of that's happened in the last three years, you can set your own time frame. And then, you know, kind of also it's it's getting everybody on board internally, you know, process adherence, and and more importantly, kind of what are the benefits of uh, of making sure and kind of getting getting your database in a in a good spot. So that's great. Um, not, another question here is around kind of how how do you fix duplicates with automation? Yep. So great question. Um, so there's a couple things we identify duplicates on email address, and, and we'll we update that uh, every night, so you can get an updated list of any candidates or sales contacts that there's another email address of the same uh, email in the system. So that kind of that awareness step is definitely step one. And then if you're looking for something more robust, um, I know Kylo has a really good deduplication system that can add even more fields and more criteria in there. It can, can do some, some automatic merging and things. Um, if, if you're doing any of that on your own, I would say tread carefully. Coming from a person that had to undo the, the wrong merge of 30 records once, um, line by line, it was, it was quite painful and took me about a week uh, just for the 30 records. So you just got to be careful and make sure you're merging the right way, that um, you're not not missing or, or um, overwriting any information that um, that you don't have. And we'll stop here on this last question. Again, really appreciate everybody um, asking away here. Um, if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out. We will we will answer and help in any way we can. But this last one is around. Um, they have a lot of candidates and clients that they've lost touch with. Uh, how how should they re-engage them? Okay, so where what I would start there with, well, first thing is you want to do staggered groups. So th the worst thing you can do is re-engage with somebody and then leave them hanging again. So you want to make sure that you're doing it in a in a scalable way. So if you have you know fifty thousand people that you want to re-engage with, break that up into smaller groups. Use our staggered start. So that you you kind of you have you take a piece of that each day, so that if any engagement comes back in, your internal teams aren't uh, overwhelmed. Um, I'd recommend prioritizing candidates and clients with placements, submissions, uh, jobs like job open jobs in the past, like that kind of thing. Uh, first, when you're doing re-engagement campaigns, and the reason for that is your internal recruiters will really love if you if you reactivate any of those candidates, because typically they're going to be placeable or they would fit something else. 
So that's a great group to kind of start with. And then the last thing I would say is just think, think about, uh, think, think, put yourself in, in the recipient's shoes, right? They haven't, they haven't talked to you in a little while. They might not even remember who you are. They might be mad at you for, for not talking with them for a while. So, you know, follow, follow that kind of give, 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 ask type methodology in your communication. Don't start with an ask right away. Um, you know, try to, try to nurture them, get them, get them back into the fold before you ask them to do something. Um, so with that, um, again, we'll, we'll stop the Q and a portion, but again, thanks everybody. So we'll, uh, thank you for joining this, our, our second of four connected recruiting workshops. Of course, we have the connected recruiting, um, website up, which has a lot of great examples, case studies, things of the sort. So feel free to check that out. That's at bullhorn.com slash connected recruiting. This, uh, we have two more workshops coming up. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the, th the third workshop is February 1st and the fourth workshop is March 1st. So feel free to register. We'd love to have you uh, for those. Uh, we'll disseminate the recording to those that couldn't attend or had to drop early. And then uh, a quick plug for myself. If, if you want to update and, and uh, get better staffing automation, um, I have a, a staffing automation newsletter that goes out every week. And also I'm doing uh, LinkedIn staffing automation posts every weekday. So um, feel free to connect, reach out, love to help you uh, on your own automation journey. Excellent. Thanks, Billy. Thank you, everyone. Again, some great questions and look forward to seeing you at our next session on February 1st. Have a good one, everybody. Bye-bye. Uh, thanks, everybody.